I started a high risk merchant processing company and it failed. It failed miserably. So all the money I made from my exit 18 months later was gone. Vehicles in, in repossession, rental properties in foreclosure. Like it was all gone, gone. Really great lessons from that as well. Hello to everyone, Anatoly Labinsky is here, our Ecom Business Stream podcast. Today on our Ecom Business podcast, we're going to be discuss amazing, amazing things about how coaches on your business can bring you to the next level. And our guest today is the Ryan Nidal, who is the leading business uh, growth specialist and the coach authority person of improving the revenue for the companies out there. And by implementing his systems, he was helping to over five companies in less than one and a half years to add in an extra $950 million of their evaluation on the market. And Nidal's current role is a business growth specialist and founder of the Nidal Group, where they are helping increasing the revenue and as well increase their possibilities to go on the expanding their business and scale it to the way where you can really leave everything on your team and find out yourself on the much bigger direction in your personal life. And he showing exactly the perfect balance between the business and between the being a great CEO and founder of the company. Ryan, what's up? How are you doing today? And I'm wonderful. I feel like you've. I need to have you ride around with me and tell people how great I am. It makes me feel better about myself as we hop on here and get to share some magic together. So thank you for the kind introduction. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually funny, but you know, like the, I, I was quite uh, excited for our podcast today because the subject which is you're about to share with the audience it would be definitely useful for people who are owners like in my industry it's mostly e-commerce uh, brand owners but they are becoming step by step as ceos and they building their own they move into the agencies they building their own marketing companies or the big brands which is like scaling horizontally with the different kind of industries and uh, for sure there is always question mark at least for me when i start my agency was how to be a great CEO and how really expand the team in the right way where you will have more your own time on the things which is must be focused the CEO on the on this position and actually I would love to listen that from your end and let's just start it from the beginning about your background how you become who you are and especially like share with the audience a bit more about what you're doing in our days absolutely be my pleasure so i like to keep these brief and impactful if you will so the the fast forward version mechanical engineering was my field of study in college which just taught me a, a methodology of thinking and that methodology of thinking is to think with the end in mind and, and really work backwards which is applied to every business since since university and so went from there into the illustrious world laughingly of luxury car sales so i was a used car sales guy for a long period of time but that was a long period of time, right? A handful of years before I moved my way up to, to running high-end car dealerships, which taught me sales, taught me marketing, taught me direct response and in, in print ads. And so there's, there's these little breadcrumbs, I say, that are a combination and a culmination of life experiences up to this point, which all become very relevant. I started looking though at, at that, that point in life where I was working 80, 90 hours a week. I was working for someone else. And while my income was good, right, a few hundred thousand dollars a year, my quality of life was pretty low. And I started to realize there was no equity I was getting, right? The paychecks were good. The travel was good. The life was good. Nice cars, nice trips, but I wasn't gaining something that was going to be worth something later in the future. So took a step back from that and jumped into a startup web hosting company. I didn't know what web hosting was. I didn't know what affiliate marketing was. I didn't know what direct response marketing was. I didn't know what a funnel was, but I knew I could sell. And so they brought me in as a sales guy and affiliate manager. It took four or five months before I took over as president and CEO. From president and CEO, raised a couple rounds of capital, took our little domestic web hosting company, took it to, to South America, did some great things that way, and then sold it off to GoDaddy, a subsidiary of GoDaddy by 29. And so that taught me right affiliate marketing and on-page optimization and user experience and email marketing and all these things that we use to drive this little startup company from nothing to $50 million a year in revenue in a really short period of time. Eventually then jumped into custom clothing. So custom clothing that 
Right, I have a, a little bit of a unique body shape. I'm, I'm taller. I used to be an amateur bodybuilder. So finding clothes that fit wasn't the easiest thing for me. I suppose I'm skipping over a little part in between where I started a high risk merchant processing company and it failed. It failed miserably. So all the money I made from my exit 18 months later was gone. Vehicles in, in repossession, rental properties in foreclosure. Like it was all gone, gone. Really great lessons from that as well. Grew a custom clothing was, company. Go ahead. Sorry for that. What was the reason for that? Why it's gone? I mean, because you you done so well. So mismanagement of funds, right? I would love to point outwardly, but it's all internal when I can look back at it. It was during the startup phase, I had I had convinced myself I had the Midas touch, right? That everything I touched was going to turn to gold and I didn't need some additional help. I thought I could do everything myself to keep margins high. And I just wasn't paying attention to some of the variables that really drive the success of those businesses. And so you get into to Q4 where chargebacks can typically spike depending on how things look. And all of a sudden I'm sitting there getting calls from Visa and MasterCard that they're shutting off my, my ISO and I needed to spend more than a few hundred thousand dollars just to, to get me back to zero, plus terminating my staff, breaking leases, whole bunch of stuff that was, you know, self, self, self-committed, right? It was, it was all on me. There was no external factor other than lack of foresight and foolish pride I on my side. Feel you, man. Yeah. And so jumped into custom clothing because I was tired of the internet world. It's like, gosh, I'm, I failed. I'm out of it. I'm done. I'm going to go a different direction. Well, I couldn't really go a different direction, right? Because once you figure out the e-com world and how that all works, it's kind of inside of you, I think at all times. So while I jumped into custom clothing, I actually designed an app to help shorten they, what's referred to as a cash to cash cycle, enhance the supply chain, make sure measurements were more dialed in. I, I'm still licensed that app to a few thousand custom clothiers across the world, own a little bit of a textile manufacturing facility in Huddersfield, England, but was mm. tired again, no quality of life. So it scaled this business, man, I'm on the road. I'm driving 80, 90,000 miles a year. I'm never home. I'm like, all right, I don't want to do this anymore either. So did an owner finance deal, sold it to my head of sales. And then jumped into the CBD space in 2016, kind of before people knew what CBD is as they know it today. And it was all affiliate based, right? Taking a lot of the things I've known from supply chain management to, to process optimization, to how to manage financials, juggling merchant processing accounts, all the things you have to do. Mm -hmm. And grew that from 16 till December of 18 and then sold it to a private equity group out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so I'm sitting around 2018, got a couple exits under my belt. Like, I don't know what's going to be next. So I started a podcast and the podcast wasn't lead gen. It wasn't leading to something. I wasn't looking to, to be known, but yet this podcast was me just sharing the stuff you're not supposed to share, you know, yeah. steroid use, infidelity, failed businesses, lies, deceit, the stuff that I knew. The I wanted, reality. Yeah. This stuff. I want to do something greater with my life. I was so afraid someone else was going to tell this story. Like I might as well just tell it myself. Well, as you know, we press that fast forward button, December of 2018, I get an email from iTunes that I was the 17th most downloaded podcast in all of iTunes for 2018, well, like six or 7 million downloads in 2018 for this, this podcast called 15 minutes to freedom, which no longer exists, right? I mean, it, mm -hmm. it ran its season, but in that I about 140 episodes in it was seven days a week, right? No breaks. Oh, I put on an offer. Just like we're having a conversation, I said, hey, if there's anything at all that I've covered that you think I could help you with, just send me an email. Here's my personal email address. Let me know if there's something. So no funnel, no process, no sales team, no merchant account. And there were about 1,400 people that emailed me over the next two days. Wow. Holy cow. There's there's something here, right? People are looking for, for additional insight to, to whatever these things are. So... Spent some time then coaching and consulting, right? From fall of 2018, really through 2019. And that ended up leading me to a bunch of individuals that were looking to sell their business. And it wasn't that I'm a M&A specialist or an investment banker. I don't have a fancy finance degree. I just have a bunch of stuff that I knew you shouldn't do, right? Because mm -hmm. I had exited enough companies, keep learning those lessons along the way. And that helped me help, gosh, 12, 13, 14 companies sell over that next, you know, 12 to 14 months. And so I started to compile this, this methodology of really maximizing the enterprise value of a business because I'm getting all these feedback points from, from looking into a business, seeing the ones that are getting a high multiple, seeing the ones that are getting a low multiple, seeing what's in between, which has then led into the current iteration of my life now where 
have a private equity fund that I manage, you know, about 150 million assets under management from, from past individuals that have funded into it. I get to be the CEO of a great company called MIT45 that sells a Kratom product that I came on as a consultant in 2018. We're about 5 million a year in annualized revenue. Last year, we we're just a tad under 70 million with almost no direct consumer, almost 100% B2B. Wow. So a lot of, lot of upside for that. And just have a great time having conversations with brilliant individuals like yourself, sharing sharing these lessons that I've learned from the past. Gosh, I'm 38 now, almost 39. So I've been in different iterations of business since I was 21. And so I've got, you know, 17 or 18 years of successes, but a lot, a heck of a lot of mistakes that I get to hop on and, 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 and share, right? Here's some things you might want to consider. Here's some things that everybody might be telling you to look at that I think is a distraction. And really just my, my goal is just to help people. I love it, man. Listen, you are one of the first people who I'm speaking with. I mean, all of us, usually we have the same kind of problems, the same kind of way to uh, results to success. But the main thing here, what I have uh, heard from you uh, is that the same like me, your journey, it was on the fails. I mean, my whole my story, whole my uh, background, it's about my fails at the beginning during the journey, like even everything looks that I'm on the top. It's a lot of uh, like screwed ups at the back end. And by what you're saying now, I feel really close for myself. Uh, and plus, when we are starting, just starting our journey, it's about like making some money, change the lifestyle, change like approach for the family. But when you're for a while, like I'm since 2017 in e-commerce business. So I'm, I feel myself still brand new. I mean, not in the, in the industry, but in the business itself, because we start growing three years ago as a company. And the thing is that I can and see now that you start drawing yourself picture what's next i mean you so you 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 are not valid anymore only on the finance you're looking like bigger picture about the, your life what's going to be happening with your life is the company life where are you going what's the vision what is going to be for the team and i love that you we are touching these points because i believe like uh who people are on the beginning they won't understand maybe this kind of subject yet but people who are already with the experience they feel our pain and not even pain feel our insights like uh, what we are feeling why are we trying to grow or even just to survive during the like the, uh, obstacles like COVID or whatever that what's going to be next in our life so I, I really want to hear from your end like uh, for example like uh, as a CEO on your position you were scaling company from five to fifty million dollars how was that what's the difference in your opinion uh to like between really like five million annual revenue to 50 million revenue like what's makes the biggest difference for the leader and what's the biggest steps you have been uh taking to bring the company to that level it's really wonderful to hear yes absolutely so i must i must acknowledge before I, I jump down this path that every person's path and journey is unique to them and while there's commonalities what i what i always hesitate with is, is i share what i did it doesn't mean it's the only way to get there. It's just it's just what I've found that has worked for me so far. And so so as I look at those, you're really saying some powerful things where I look at that zero to a million dollars. I look at that as the, the true, true essence of the hustle phase, right? You can typically do it by yourself. You find market message match or product market fit. You, you figure out how to market a product. You might figure out how to build a funnel or two. You, you, you can figure out a Shopify store. And to me, you can typically get to a million dollars in annualized revenue or greater without a big team, right? It's a lot of hard work. It can be a lot of hours, but, and, and maybe that even goes as far as 5 million, where it's a small tactical team, where there's maybe some outsources and things like that. Everybody has their own methodology. But at some point I started to realize I can't work harder to make more money. There's no more hours in a day. I'm not going to be able to get that much more intelligent. While I love to read and love to focus, there's just a carrying capacity that we all have. And, and everybody's carrying capacity is different, but but yet there's a ceiling to it. And so you have to sit back and look to me at that five to, you know, maybe 10, 15, maybe even $20 million range where I start to look at, okay, where do I want to take this business? Do I want it to be a lifestyle business? Do I want it to be something that's got a, a large enterprise value that I can sell it off one day for a capital gains event? Do I want to just keep it where it sits at status quo? Mm -hmm. And when I determine those, my answer has always been, I'd like to create something that's a sellable entity. I like the excitement of the growth, but also knowing, gosh, I could sell this for three, five, 10, maybe 15 times net cash flow, right? EBITDA. 
and saying, gosh, that, that sounds really attractive to me. Cause I also get a little bored after a seat, you know, after a period of time, right? That three, four, five years, I start getting that itch for conquering something new quite often. And so to go from that five to we'll say 20, it's the acknowledgement to start with that I might want to sell the business. Then it's the acknowledgement of, I probably can't do everything myself. I probably have to start looking for, you know, a chief revenue officer or a CMO mm -hmm. or a CFO. And that's painful as a solopreneur because all of a sudden you use these really healthy margins, right? There's, there's a lot of money flowing in at that point. You're living this great lifestyle. And all of a sudden you're going to dip into your pockets a little bit because you're going to bring in some, some really qualified individuals. And so it's the interview process. It's finding people that have already been further than a company's at in that moment. Right. I don't want to hire a CFO that's only only ran a five million dollar year business. I need a CFO that's ran a 30 million dollar year business because I need their knowledge to help me get there. Same thing with to me, the majority of the C-suite. But those mm -hmm. roles are, depending on where you live, you know, 200 to half million dollars a year is an expected salary. So you're thinking, oh my gosh, that, that's a lot of my profit right now. So there's this leap of faith again of going into saying, Gosh, I'm running a, a good a good product store. You know, maybe it's a 20% net income. You know, maybe it's $5 million a year with a million fold in bottom line. And you know that, that maybe a great CFO is 300 grand. That's a large chunk of that. And you're like, they don't generate revenue. How are they going to help me? You know, mm -hmm. especially most entrepreneurs start looking at it and like, I don't even understand what finance is. There's money in the bank account. I'm paying my bills. Everything's fine. So it's another side that I believe that most entrepreneurs that the business is really only four things marketing operations sales and some level of service fulfillment most of us have a propensity for two of those right for me it's sales and marketing love sales love marketing i can't say i'm a lead at marketing but i'm really really good at sales but by the nature of that you know service and and, and the op operations are areas that someone else could probably do better and so the first hire to me has to be the person that's your counterpart you know, we, and that's a little friction, right? Because we'd like to be around people that are like us. And all of a sudden we're hiring someone that's kind of the polar opposite. They're almost a yin to your yang. And it's like, man, this, this finance or accounting professional is telling me no all the time. And I just want to hear yes, <laughs> but it's a really powerful thing, especially when they start negotiating terms, helping buy down your cost of goods, help increasing your, your, you know, free cash flow. There's a lot of benefits to that. But then to me from the 20, as we start looking towards 50, then it's, you know, really putting on that true CEO hat and saying, gosh, I have to be focused on initiatives that are 12, 18, 24 months ahead. When I'm sitting in my office, it almost doesn't matter what's going on right now. And it, it's taking off that, that firefighter hat almost, right? Where I think the, the best firefighters are also the best arsonists. You know, we create our own problems as CEOs because we like to have those things to solve. And it's like, oh my gosh, I got I to gotta get out of the day-to-day -day activities because I'm now causing more problems than it's really worth. I need to start looking at strategic acquisitions. I need to start looking at, to me, at that level, a CEO really has three primary roles. It's capital allocation. So the, the free cash flow you have in your bank, it's not to put in your pocket, it's to send that out and generate a return on that investment. It's growing company culture, right? It's, it's really figuring out how you want the company to feel and look and operate and helping people adhere to that. Mm -hmm. And then the third is strategic relationships. And whether it's, you know, your two or three largest affiliates or your two or three largest suppliers or, you know, the, the two or three large, you know, merchant processing partners, whatever it would be, that you just have an intimate friendship with them where it goes from this transactional business model to you're actually spending time with them. You're getting to know them and their family and their business and what's important to them. So you're bonding into something greater. And that's a really great place between that 20 and 50 million as far as how to start really growing that enterprise value of the business. Then there's a whole nother skill set, right? From 50, 50 to 100. Now we start getting into, I think in order to be an effective CEO, you really have to start understanding some of the financial modeling that's required for the investment banking world. You got to need to start to understand return on investment capital and discounted cash flow analysis and some things that it's like, what do those terms even mean? <laughs> but it's so important for the acquisitions of market share, especially, you know, you look at the e-com world right now where you've got these comparable businesses that are smaller in scale, that if you could combine them into one entity, mm -hmm. you get a stronger buying power, better rates, better fulfillment. And so you start looking like, man, how can I really go and dominate a market? And then you start almost pivoting to consider exits and what those look like, right? Because the higher your EBITDA on a company, the more it's worth, the more attractive it is. It's easier for me to sell 
a $10 million year EBITDA company than it is to sell a $1 million EBITDA company because the return on investment capital to a private equity group or an investment banker is higher. Yeah, uh, you know, like this is the difference what keep uh, the small business owner uh, different from the person who is really building multiple eight figures, nine figures businesses. And especially like the goal to see the exit and you when you f finally like oh, I would tell you over a year ago, I wasn't even thinking about the exit. I wasn't thinking about all the rules about what's the reason for creating a real bigger, bigger business, business except revenue, revenue, profitability, better life. But when I start realizing and start networking with the right people and finding out like what's really matter in the business and what has to be done, the great CEO, I like, oh, oh <laughs> it's completely different game it's completely different thoughts and if you go in that way you have to play in the rules of of the same what other people are doing in this game and that's actually more fun um well even not more stressful i won't say that but it's really more fun more interesting and the knowledge which you are getting it brings you to the next level who you are that's why it's becoming not that important anymore revenue it's becoming important something already bigger in your life and that's generating really more interest into the implementing something new into the business and hiring more difficult process i can i can tell you it's definitely for several people who i was talking to my personal experience the right hirings it's uh, for sure gonna be the or killer or uh bring your to the new uh, new level with your company that's an amazing uh, uh explanation from your end that you said that hire the person who was on the higher uh, like position company than yours so he will bring the new knowledge that's that's 100 percent true yes and i'd love to to poke at that hiring process for just a minute because it's something that that right i did there was no there was no college course i took there was no offer that appeared in my facebook feed on, on how to hire high level professionals right it just wasn't something that i got to take a course in or study in and so a lot of it's been trial by error it's like how do you even do that the right way well, to start with, the best talent in the world is currently employed somewhere, right? I don't know mm -hmm. about yourself, but as I go back over the 18 years that I've worked professionally, I've never been unemployed, right? I've always, I've always had a job or, or owned a business, something I could step into. So mm -hmm. we start with the fact of, we can even look at if you want to run an ad on something like Indeed or on LinkedIn, you take more of a copywriting approach. And what most people do is you go to Indeed, you copy somebody else's ad, you change it just a little bit and you throw it up. Well, especially in the direct response space, right? We understand something about copy. We understand something about conversions, right? How do you have that attention grabbing headline? How do you separate mm -hmm. yourself from everybody else? But we shut that part of our brain off in running an ad for good talent because it doesn't fit. Well, to me, the company culture of businesses like yours or potentially like mine, I don't want to fit in somebody else's box. I want it to be a specific. I want you, I want you to feel like part of something different. So it starts with, I'll call it that lead ad. It's the same thing, you know, in, in a direct response space, except now our, our, our target is a strategic partner. It's someone that has a skill set. So that ad needs written like, like a long form VSO. It needs to, it needs to indoctrinate people into why they want to be a part of the company. And then once I start going down the path with you, I like to do a push pull methodology where quite often we get into selling people on why they should be a part of our company. There's this scarcity mindset that pops in of, here's how great we are, here's our revenue, here's our profit, here's our, our benefits. Well, I'll, I'll get to that eventually, but I need to challenge you to see why you're a good fit for my company, mm -hmm. right? Like, I, I know what I have, and it's not to be egotistical or arrogant, it's to say, hold on a second, are you a good fit? And so I run people through a little bit of an automated process where I actually have them record a two minute or less YouTube video and it's got very specific mm -hmm. instructions. And I don't really care what the video says. I care, did they follow directions? Could they That's figure important. out how to, yeah. to, to, to create? Directly, minus out? several people directly. Yeah, it's true. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So let's assume they pass that and they eventually end up in the interview process. One of the things that ends up being important is that, that we really challenge someone's belief system in, in what's possible. Right, because for me, it's a cultural adherence in addition to a hard skill set. There are so many great high-level people 
that come from a more stodgy environment, that expect things to be very, I'll say linear, that might have worked at a, I even say a Fortune 1000 company. And while I might be enamored with the fact of, oh my gosh, I can hire a Google CFO. Mm -hmm. It's not nimble enough, right? They're expecting things to move pretty, I'll say slowly, where in our world, it's quick. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of iterations. It's a lot of, it's a lot of rapid growth. And so once someone has the skill sets and the hard skills, then to me, we challenge their cultural adherence. We, we have to understand if they're a good cultural fit, because it's that, it's that accurate, you know, that, that metaphor that one bad apple can spoil the bunch. Well, that's true in a company culture as well. When you have that employee, especially in a high position that doesn't fit culturally, that's, you know, a little too aggressive or maybe a little too soft. It could go either way. All of a sudden, the staff that's been around for a long time starts to have their confidence eroded in leadership, right? In, in us as founders. So the hiring process is its own, you know, microcosm of really a direct response campaign into itself. There's some push pull, there's some copywriting, there's some attention grabbing headline. There's a series of upsells and, and, and cross sells and, and bump sells that go in through the process. There's, I look at it as, you know, I, I would call it a, an order confirmation read. Mm -hmm. Right. Where I'm a, once someone's across the finish line that I'm not going to quite onboard them until I go back through and give them that order confirmation to ensure that we didn't miss anything. And so it's really how do we make it relatable to things that we're familiar with? Because the process is very comparable. Yeah. Uh, since you mentioned about the uh, motivation and in general vision uh, for the team, I mean, to build the culture, uh, to culture, which is going to be helping move forward and uh, keeping the right people with you, because especially A players, the right, uh, right talents, they are not staying with us only because of money. Like you were saying, mentioning the CFO of Google, and he obviously could be hunted by the better idea not better income. He already like kind of wealthy person and he has great income in annual, uh, annual income, but uh, by giving him something bigger, something better in terms of he gonna be a part on something incredible, more suited for him than uh, like just a huge corporation and great income, it's beat their eight players to compare to just financial part. And uh, I believe the culture is really important. And uh, I guess you have some kind of great uh, points about that, like how, what kind of culture you were building in your companies, how that was look like, and uh, what is in your opinion was the most important points for building a culture in the company? Yes, those are really, really good questions. I think I don't want to give credit where credit is due. And to me, a business that's that's below 50 million a year in revenue or potentially below 100, 100 employees. If you look at some of the work from a gentleman named Gino Wickman, who who has a book called Traction, he actually created something called the EOS system, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. And to create culture is to at first sit back and say us as founders or you, or you as a founder, right? What are the four or five core values that you want your company to exhibit? Right. And it does that does that bleed through your hiring process, your firing process and everything in between. And those five values are typically one word. And the process that the Gino suggests you walk through is to write down names of people that if your entire staff was filled with just those people, you'd be incredibly happy. And so let's say there's it's typically people, you know, but let's say one is, is Michael Jordan just for just for ease right now. And so mm -hmm. you used to write down Michael Jordan's name and you write down four or five adjectives about Michael Jordan as to why you'd want him to be a part of your company. Well, it might be drive. It might be focus. It might be tenacity. There's things that make Michael Jordan a a appealing to you. And you go through and you come up with five, six, seven names and you write down those, those adjectives that, that really define who they are. Then you start looking through those adjectives and you see the ones that are repetitive, right? The goal is to start to pull out similarities and you start seeing man, drive is written on this list six times. Well, probably something that's important to you then is to have drive as part of your, your company values. You want people that have that internal drive and you might have tenacity. And so these things start to come out and then you define what drive means to you. And it doesn't have to be the Webster's dictionary version of drive. Drive to you might be, you know, um, making things happen at all costs, right? Whatever. Yeah. It, it doesn't much matter what that is. And then you write that down on the sheet of paper that is that Gino refers to as the VTO, the Vision Traction Organizer, because a, there's a duality that exists inside a business between the vision of where you want to go and how you want to get there, and then the traction 
to actually help propel you in that direction. And so the vision is the, the five core values. The vision is where do you want to be in 10 years, right? What's that revenue number? What's that big, you know, that BHAG, that big, hairy, audacious goal for the revenue. And if you say, I want to sell the company in 10 years, well, let's just assume that the company itself still exists. Where do you want the revenue to be? You know, like a billion dollars. It's not how to get there. It's just that placeholder. Huh. Then you get into, okay, who's your ideal client and, and how do you know that the market size is large enough? Now, obviously in, in the e-com world, we probably have a pretty good sense of that. That's probably something that's already existing. Then we start to pull down into, right? What really makes us unique as a company, because there should be a unique sales process. And I, I air quote unique because of course there's not right. If, if you're, if you own a Shopify store in, in theory, the process is con, is consistent, but yet most marketers haven't turned it into a unique process that you can share with the customer of what they're going through. It's not serve an ad, get them to buy, get an order confirmation, ship a product. You could actually uniquely name each one of those steps to make you feel different than everybody else. And so that ends up being the vision side. Then there's the traction side, which is the three year, the one year and the 12 week sprint to achieve those things. And once you go through those and you know, it might take a day or two to go through it the first time it's to sit with it for a week or two. Uh -huh. and make sure that it really feels appropriate. It's not this rush. Hey, I've got this shiny object. I'm gonna go make sure the entire team knows about it. You hold off, you, you temper that excitement for just a moment. And then when you revisit it and it still feels really solid, then you spend the next 90 days sharing it consistently with your staff. And that's really where this breaks down quite a bit. It's right to me. It's an old marketing premise. I'll use, I use some of the stuff from, um, I'll say Frank Kern. And it, 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 it can be Dan Kennedy as well. It's that, it's that saying, right? If you haven't upset somebody by 10 AM, you're not marketing hard enough. Well, what, what ends up happening is inside of our company, most employees don't understand the vision until we're tired of saying it. That's the first time it starts to click for them. And we think, gosh, I sent you this sheet of paper. We had a call about it. Of course, you're going to get it. But it doesn't really work that way, right? We have to keep reinstilling it over a 60, 90 day period. That's not to beat people over the head with it. It's to start, you know, weekly calls by saying, Hey, just want to revisit our five core values. Hey, want to revisit where we're going in 10 years. Hey, want to revisit it just really quickly. And so that starts to be a part of the company. And when we have to have those corrective conversations, right? Because as leaders, we certainly do people, mm -hmm. I'll say step out of bounds. It's not they're bad people, just things happen. It's really easy to revert back, revert back to the VTO and say, Hey, telling the truth is, is a core competency of our business. That's a core value. And you, you just kind of broke one of our core values. And I want to talk through it. I'm not mad at you for it, but caught you in something that doesn't feel like the exact truth. You see very clearly the truth is a core value. I shared openly that we hire and fire based around our core values. I'm not threatening to fire you right now, but we really have to talk about this where it starts to remove some of the emotion because it's been in black and white for people. So th there's a whole process of that. Again, if, if you're interested, you're listening to this, have a conversation, Gino Wickman, the book traction or what the heck is EOS. All of his books are bright orange, really, really good reads for some of those entrepreneurial operating systems. He makes operating a business pretty simple. Nice. And, uh, in this particular example, like what, uh, on your companies was common core value for you, which you were duplicating uh, by implementing on different uh, industries? Yes, that's a really, really good question. So one of the things that's just in incredibly important to me is to strive for excellence. That excellence ends up being the standard. And so that gets massaged in different ways, right? We can call that a bunch of different things. We, it doesn't matter how we look at it. It's a feeling and intention behind it of it's consistently saying, how can we get better? And so we can look at the Japanese manufacturing process called Kaizen, which is incremental improvement over all things. It's how do you become 1% better consistently? And it's really saying there's always a way to do something better. And we get so focused on, you know, revenue and profit. And we, we focus on, man, how can we make more money and how can we keep more money? Uh -huh. But there's also the entire customer experience. There's also the entire quality of goods. There's also so many aspects to not only the outward facing company, but I'll call it that inward facing company that it's, it's important to me. You know, we I'm, I'm fortunate inside of MIP 45, the company that we've got five rooftops, right? So we've got about a hundred full-time employees in five different locations. 
And it's a small thing of saying, you know, excellence means you'd be willing to eat off the bathroom floor. And people say, gosh, that's extreme. Like, what do you mean eat off the bathroom floor? Well, if you don't clean up after yourself and you leave a mess, it's not really that that bleeds into every other aspect of the business. But when you hold yourself to a high standard, like the president of the United States is coming to visit tomorrow, things start to change because that that small change starts to ripple through the business. And it takes a while. It takes a while for the culture to start to catch up to that. And it's not, again, to yell at people and, you know, browbeat them. It's saying, gosh, when I open a refrigerator, are all the bottles of water, you know, facing label out orderly mm -hmm. and organized? Are, you know, as we're fulfilling packages, are we taking a moment to handwrite a note mm -hmm. and do a little bit of research to see who that person is? Like, let's let's pull up their Instagram profile. Let's pull up their TikTok. Let's pull up their Facebook and let them know that we care about them and not just tell them we care about them. Can we show, man, I really like the post you made on December 22nd about your dog. I love bulldogs. Like mm -hmm. you get your package, and yes, on, on one side, it's it's counterintuitive, right? Because that's that's lowering the efficiency of the business. Your profitability is going to take a small decrease because there's more labor hours to handwrite that note. But then there's a rebound effect on the backside because that message starts to get out in the in the ecosystem, where the person's saying, "Holy cow, this company took the time to actually scroll through my my socials and actually see what I'm about." They're not going to be able to help themselves, but to to share that on social because it's so uncommon right now. Yeah. You think of how we operate inside of, I'll say the traditional world, not the e-com world. If you go to the same restaurant, the same bar, the same gym, it doesn't feel great when someone says hello, they remember your name. They, it's those little tiny things. They don't have to give you something for free. They don't, they're not buying your loyalty. It's like, Hey Ryan, great. See, I couldn't notice you haven't been in the past week. Is everything okay? <laughs> oh yeah. I've just been traveling this at the other man. I'm just, I'm just glad you're back like that. Those, those little tiny touches start to create a, I'll call it a movement. It, it changes and really creates that differentiator, but it, it all pushes back to how do you make excellence a standard? How do you have it be that at any given point, everybody's striving to get just a little bit better? Uh, like this kind of approach, which you just described with the person you meet in the gym and he, you, you note, you, you notice and show him that you notice that he was absent for a week. It's a great example. Like, uh, what I was always delivering uh, kind of thoughts to my sales team. Like when, you, uh, especially when they were doing outreach in the past, it's important. If, if the person is staying with the dog or with the family or with the specific car, like speak about that speak about them because they feel like because they get approached in our okay back 2017 to 2018 there was approaches but not that much like in our days in 2023 like it's completely different game in terms of having engagement online with new people and when you are reaching out and hey i'm selling the course or hey i have a coaching program Everyone like go cool, like yourself and that's it. Like they ban you or they want to report respond or just like never respond and leave you on scene. And what's the makes difference if when people are typing something about you and you mention about 22nd December to allow your post? It's exactly like on my Instagram, so many DMs from people who are trying to sell me something. And I, I really sometimes just approve people who made the most a really best approach and sometimes there was like something which is nobody noticed but he went to google he find out me in some kind of like completely outstanding format and he texted to me about that which is obviously not obvious thing you know in front of our uh, ball eyeballs uh, there and like i was like wow you want to sell me something but i love your approach i just accept you i ask you what you're saying because just like i want to show your appreciation and at the same time i'm sharing with my team like listen this is the way this is the way like how you you like if you make my attention it means for obvious average person out there the attention will be grabbed for sure because we know that like as we were discussed recently with some of the friends uh from the masterminds like a business owners we uh we really destroyed our joy of life because we know when so we were speaking to the stranger we know are they trying to sell something to us or they just awesome dude who want to talk to you and thinking that you're awesome dude we just destroy this feeling of happiness because we already an we analyzing like when we talk to someone else we analyzing if he's trying to sell or he just want to be a great guy and this kind of destroying your feelings about the normal stuff and showing you that okay but obvious average person out there your perfect customer he is not with the, that kind of experience and feelings so like this is a 
perfect approach like which you described because like it's not obvious for most sales processes and most even engagement processes and people like why why I cannot get his, his attention because you're like really doing it the wrong way i love that man seriously that's a good point and uh, regarding the excellency i mean uh, that's a really i believe uh, strong one of the really strong uh, culture uh, core value and I, i'm wondering like because it's not easy to create it's not easy to hire one person and let's go yeah let's go man and like he, everyone are smart on the tongue when they're talking when you meet them first time when you hiring them they will tell you whatever you want to hear just to get hired I mean, just to be at work. But when they start working, it's like they like if it's, we are speaking about the online work in my end, they start missing the calls on the call number three. They delay into the calls, like and so on, so on. But on the interview, they are the best people who I can ever met. So here is my question: How often you have been screwed on that process, and how have you deal with that? Because easy to speak about excellency and uh, hard to really build that. Yeah, so pretty often, right? It, I, I've gotten the short end of the stick and it, it caused me to reevaluate the process where you're saying some really profound things. People interview very well, right? You can read four, five, six different interview books and you can show up the right way. You can send the mm -hmm. thank you notes. You can know how to answer all the questions and that's part of it. But what I started to, to, to notice is if that's, if that's a possibility, Right. It becomes my responsibility to create a process to have that be less and less of a possibility. And so some of the things we've done to, to assist with that is actually to use third party software to start to have people take different different levels of assessments that are fairly brief, but nonetheless show us something that we might not have seen before. And one of those is, is software. I don't have any affiliation with these softwares, it's just what I use inside of my companies. One is called Predictive Index. And predictive index, you can create a job title and predictive index pulls data from a, a large number of different sources and says, okay, the best media buyer probably has, you know, a personality profile that's in, in these certain ranges. And someone takes a simple eight, 10, 12 question test. It takes, it takes at best, you know, two minutes to take. It's not complicated, but they take it and it shows you something. And it might show you that while they're interviewing really well, the facts are, they're just interviewing very well, right? They're mm -hmm. not a, they're not a great fit. And so I'll assume that they are a good fit. Then they eventually take another um, series of assessments through a, another software platform called Criteria. And Criteria starts to get into some of those really deeper under logical, under, under the surface psychological underpinnings, where certainly we, we now can really test for their hard skills, right? Someone can interview very well, say I'm the best media buyer, here's all my success, here's my track record, but there's also the adherence. They're probably good at math. They're probably good at spatial re recognition, spatial reasoning. There's some things that would go into that person, plus some personality assessments. And so that's another process to it. Now, a little different because most of the staff that works with me, they, they have to show up to an office, right? So I have to acknowledge mm -hmm. the fact that if someone's a remote worker, it's a little bit different. But I do like to see the type of car they drove in on, not because I care about the car. I care did they... If I have somebody go out and walk past their car, is there trash in the back seat? Is that is the, the back tire <laughs> flat? Is the bumper all yeah, scuffed yeah. up? And then same thing, if it's not that, I mean, it's virtual. It's like, hey, like walk me through your house real quick. And it's not to judge someone, right? I don't, I'd like to acknowledge Show that, the personality. I mean? Yeah, I need to see more. If if we're in a perfect setting, right? I, I have a bookshelf behind me as we're talking and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty scripted, right? Because I'm on Zoom, of course, it's going to look a certain way. What happens if you take that camera and you walk through and you see the rest of the office or the rest of the home and all of a sudden it's in disarray. There's things that that aren't in alignment anymore. Well, it's, it's, it's not even that person's a bad hire, but it's the acknowledgement that how they're presenting themselves is probably slightly different than how they show up in, in the real world. And so it's a combination of that and sharing from the start. Like We're, we're an organization that's performance-based. And that has its blessings and its curses. The blessings are, I reward performance. You make more money, you get bigger bonuses, you get mm -hmm. more perks. The downside for that is, if you're someone that doesn't like to perform, I'm going to be able to smell that in the first 30 days, and you're not going to be employed anymore. And so I'd rather, you, I'd rather you save me and you the headache 
and just say right off the bat, I like something that's nice and stable and consistent, a little slow, where I can kind of sit in the corner and, and mind my own business. Uh -huh. because I love the living daylight side of you. I've got a lot of friends that run organizations that way. You'd be a great fit for their culture, but I'd chew you up and spit you out. It's not how we work here, but that shifts, right? That's that difference in kind of begging people to come work with us because of how hard it is to hire good employees versus getting to a point and saying, what are all the reasons you're not a good fit? How do I know that you're not the best cultural fit? And even then we're, we're massively growing right now inside of that organization I made mention of. So we're hiring two to four people a week and we probably have an 85 to 90% success rate. I get you the exact data. We track everything, but it's still not perfect, right? There's, there's still people that's, I don't say sneak through because I don't think they're doing something bad. I just don't think they fully understand what it means to have a standard of excellence and performance based in orientation because it's, it's direct, right? And some people, that's another one of our, our core values is to be direct, to be candid. And I have no problem saying like, you're doing an amazing job. Thank you so much. You're, you're absolutely doing incredible. But in two weeks from now, if you're, if you're not doing incredible, I'm going to have that same conversation of you're missing your numbers. You're not doing the right thing. You have to course correct because we got a long way to go in a short time to get there. So how are you going to tune up? And sometimes people, especially in today's society, you know, get their feathers ruffled a little bit about, well, what do you mean? I'm not doing a good job. I, your numbers are showing. You are not doing a good job right now. I'm not mad at you, but the the details yeah, show numbers are you are missing lying. objectives. And so it, it's 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 gotten better. I, I would say our success rate in in last season throughout you know quarter one through three last year was maybe sixty percent, maybe maybe sixty five. We're closer to ninety percent now. I think a hundred percent would be incredible, but maybe it's slightly unrealistic. I think when we get to a 95% success rate, we'll really have a great hiring process and onboarding process. And it's really, it's that success ramp. It's no different than with, with a new customer that you want to activate and get them indoctrinated into your brand. We have to do the same thing with staffing. We have to create that 30, 60, 90, 120 day success path. So that people know that they're excelling. So people have those things to chase versus, oh, you're a good employee. We're hiring you right now. Everything's great. You know, go forward and prosper. I think most people need more than that. And us as entrepreneurs, we don't, right? You, you started a business, you're self-motivated. I'm going to make it work no matter what. And most employees don't quite have that same mental makeup, thankfully, right? Because if, if so, they'd probably be out owning their own business versus being an employee to help us grow ours. You know, uh, regarding the hiring like 60 person, it's already awesome. I mean, really awesome. Like, how many uh, years it took for you? to really like master what is happening at the company right now and how important it was to hire the right uh, HR to your team to make the difference to questions. So I would say we still don't have it mastered. And, and just truthfully, we grew from 5 million to 11 to uh, I think 23 to 40 to 70. So every 12 months, it's, it's almost a completely new business, mm -hmm. right? And, and so while it's the same company, there's just different things to conquer. Not everybody we hire in this season is going to have the tenacity and the forethought to be involved in the next season. That was something that we had to just recalibrate our, our belief system. I want everybody to be in there for the long haul, right? I want everybody to be part of our company in perpetuity, but some people just, that's not, that's not going to be the best for them. And it's not the best for us. So again, I'd love to say I've got it mastered with the 80 plus employees we have now, but I don't. And as, as we look at that HR side, HR is something that I, I'm on the fence with. And as, as we're growing to the next capacity, HR is a, a big push for us, but not in the traditional sense of, you know, an office to have somebody come and complain to. And I want everybody to feel, you know, protected and safe. But we took a different path and we started with a talent acquisition specialist. So it's really a salesperson for our company that's consistently really cold DMing people that are already employed at other places. And so, so she does such a fascinating and phenomenal job of cold outreach on LinkedIn, cold outreach on social, looking for really high caliber employees to, you know, persuade them to sell them on leaving their company and coming into ours and showing that we're a better, better place to work. Because I, I truly believe that the best employees are always employed, right? Like yeah. It, it, unless someone has just sold a company, right? And that happens, or a company has been bought and a, and a key position has been eradicated. 
the best talent has a job right now. So you got to get somebody that's really hungry to go out and go get them versus just, I'm going to post an ad on Indeed, run some traffic to it and see what happens. While that, while that helps, while that, that is something there, it's just not the most efficient or effective. So HR has been something that we're still working to round out, but the talent acquisition side, we've got, we've got that pretty dialed in now with a series of assessments and, and zoom and, and video calls and in-person meetings and a, a nice cadence to it, which, which is really proven prosperous for us. I think that it's just one of those things, right? That quite often, you know, I, I think the people that are, I'll say further down the road than maybe we are, they're mm -hmm. very quick to say, I've got it all figured out. And I'll tell you, I, I don't have it all figured out. We're still growing. We're still learning. We're still iterating. And I think that's a necessary component of all business growth is to take to take what you hear from somebody and apply it in the way that makes sense to you, but iterate through that no different than split testing an ad campaign. It's like the, the lessons that we learn in direct response marketing, they actually apply everywhere inside of all aspects of business. Someone just hasn't created that relatability hook for us to understand like, hold on, our onboarding process, we should probably split test that and then track the success metrics to understand if that was the best way to do that. Mm -hmm. Hey, our, our our offboarding process, right? When someone gets terminated or leaves, we should probably keep optimizing that process versus, oh, we did it once, we left it there, it's over in the corner, it, it works good enough, which happens so often. And what worked in this season probably won't work so well in the next season. Business takes growth, business takes iteration to me. Uh you know, regarding what you were mentioned uh, about HR and uh, in general, the, your success rate right now, can you tell me, please, uh, what's exactly the steps? I mean, uh, when you were hiring, your first hirings, well, have you got the enough budget to hire under the talents or you were having hired for uh the perspective i mean what's their potential and are you still hiring people if you were hiring on the potential or you hiring only on the terms of talents because uh, it's really important for people who has limited budget uh what would you suggest and what was your way before yeah talents so or, or, or we, potential? That's a, that's such a brilliant question in the previous season of business, right? When I look at from five to 11 million, kind of that, that season of life. And that was, a, that was a 12 month season for us. We hired a lot on potential and it wasn't because of net income for us, right? We still had good margins, but our, our mindset, our corporate culture at that point was, man, we wanna, we wanna bring people along for the journey. We wanna enroll and inspire them. We wanna help them become better than they are now. So we were willing to hire people that were maybe earlier in their career because we we took great pride in in coaching them and training them and bring them bringing them along but as the company has grown and matured i had to start acknowledging the fact that as the leadership team right i mean i've got a chief revenue officer a, a chief marketing officer a chief financial officer a chief tech officer a, you know i've got the c-suite of individuals that are are very talented if half of their time is spent coaching someone like to, mm -hmm. to i'll say you know carrying somebody else's load up the mountain they're not able to do go as far as fast. And so there was a shift that happened, you know, probably somewhere around the 25 million mark for us, give or take plus or minus, where I started to sit back and look and say, okay, I, I want to hire, I want to pay top of market for top tier talent. So let's shift our perspective on this. Instead of hiring somebody that's, that's good enough, let's hire someone that's past where we're at right now. Let's, let's, let's ensure that someone has been further than we are now, especially in key positions. Now it's not going to be everywhere, right? I mean, take sales, a good, hungry sales prof professional that's polished, that shows up the right way, right? You can, if you're like me, you, you can feel a good sales guy, you know, when someone's good and it doesn't matter if they don't have a W2 that shows they made a quarter million dollars before you just know they're going to be good. And I'm okay training that skill because there's the economy of scale there, right? We've got a lot of sales guys and, and sales professionals, salesmen and women. So I can, I can throw them in a system and get them trained up pretty quickly. But as we start looking, you know, the director level and the C-suite level, there's no time left for how fast we want to go. I shouldn't say there's no time left. It's just not the efficient use of time where it's saying more of, gosh, this year, this, this company I'm referring to, our, our target's 125 million annualized revenue. And as I'm looking at that, it's saying, if half of our time is spent 
training people on how to become better, it's almost mathematically impossible for us to double the size of the company again, because it, it becomes this economy of scale that's, that's just not reasonable. It's not feasible. Again, you can't work harder at some point. You have to work better and maybe smarter, whatever, whatever terminology you want to use. And so to me, it's that, it's that fine line for every business owner of saying, okay, what is my net margin right now? How much free cash flow do I have? And what's the best way I can deploy it? And it's different for every business, right? Where I'll say, if, if you're an incredible marketer, you're a great copywriter, you're a great funnel builder, and you're not that great at sales, but you've done sales because you've had to. I can say pretty solidly, if you go hire a really elite level sales manager that can go get sales talent, it might be painful for the first 30 or 60 days, but typically those people pay for themselves very, very quickly because they, they go bring people that have a skill set. Like it's, it becomes this exponential growth curve where you don't even know how hard it is for you to sell because you've just had to do it versus, man, if I could just focus on copywriting and marketing and funnel creation optimization, I'd get my sales team more leads. And so it's, I, I cringe to generalize any answer because they are so specific for every situation. I will say at this point with where I'm at in business, even looking at some of the startups I'm a part of and startups, a little misnomer, right? Businesses that are $5 million a year in, in revenue or, or less, right? I'm, I'm kind of, I come in at the 1 million mark is kind of, I don't like the, I have an idea, let's go. I like to know the idea is already working. As I look at those, we're even going through recalibration of, man, let's just find the best talent we can afford. Let's just, let's just do that because over time that will catch up in my experience, but that is a shift. If you, if we had this conversation 18 to 24 months ago, my answer would have been completely different. I would have said, you know what? Hire, hire good talent, train them along the way, learn together, grow together. I just, I think there's a place for both. I think you have to decide at what levels of the company are you willing to allow that to be? If you lead people. I think leaders need to have been further than we're at now. If you're someone that is being led, it might be okay if you don't have a, a ton of previous experience. Uh, can you tell me, like, uh, first of all, I want to give a point from my end that from what you are saying, it's exactly when you went to a different level, you understand that you don't have any more time to teach them and you don't want your managers will be destroyed by uh, using their energy on the teaching. Uh, all my company have been built in 2020 when I hired like in the first year 12 people and all of them were just good enough in terms of uh, potential. And I was teaching all of them and I had time and I was like enjoying the process and I was like, wow, we're going to be building more and more teams like that. but. This year, I mean, the, the past year, 2022, I realized that time is more important. And when we are on the process of hiring, but uh, potentials were not giving us any value. It was, uh, we were firing them later on. But uh, when we hired the CFO from restaurant industry, but he knows how to implement the things all together from the bigger level, it's like what I feel, I really feel all your speed, you know, what everything was saying, it's so... Uh, close to what I'm going through and went through recently that really we just uh, hired CFO, we hired one person integrator for different directions with the experience, both of them. And it's made our life so easier past year than it was before. It's like, it's really incredible. Just two simple people for 30 plus people made a difference, you know? And uh, I, I love the, the way how you explained that. And here is a question I like, uh, guys, I went the, the, like into the HR. I don't know how that came to, but it's just interesting subject. One last question about the HR. Your opinion as a company owner, would you uh, hire the talent if you're not able financially yet i mean if if you cannot cover him financially yet but you know that it's a talent which is gonna be makes the difference would we take a risk and hire him or you would wait Ooh, i love the question my actual answer is i would wait i believe that a, I, I i my brain doesn't function that, that the venture capitalist type of methodology where you go out and you, you raise debt to grow a company that's pre-revenue I think that the best businesses are cash flow themselves, right? And so I look at how do I deploy, 
how do I deploy those net dollars? How can I get the biggest yield and return? And it's one of those things of, I might for a season, look at the facts and say, gosh, I've, I've really enjoyed making, but you know, I'll, I'll say a million dollars a year. The number doesn't much matter, but gosh, if I pull back my income just a little bit, or if I, if I curtail my distributions that I really don't need at this point, right? I don't need another watch. I don't need another car. I don't need another vacation. What if I, what if I recalibrate just for a season? Could I, could I go out and find that person to help me grow? What I don't believe in doing is, is pushing into the red for the possibility of something becoming greater. It's just not how my brain works personally. I look at it the fact of, especially once you're established, I think in a startup mode, it might make sense. You might bring in a key employee, you might give them a little a stock issuance or a little, a little grant for some success in the future because you need certain people to help propel you quicker. But once your product market fit, once you're five, $10 million a year in annualized revenue, I don't, I don't adhere to the fact of, you know, hiring when I don't have the money for it. I need mm -hmm. to recalibrate the business to create the, to create the free cash flow to support that. And then as I go to market looking for that person, I need to make certain that the person has the skill set that's going to justify my investment in them. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's the justification of the investment over and over again that we look at where to me, as I really started analyzing, like, gosh, I'm, I was trying to negotiate because I'm a sales guy. I was trying to negotiate to show that I could win with all the potential hires. Like I want to negotiate down their comp plan. I started looking, okay, the business, if I negotiate and get you at $58,000 a year versus $75,000 a year. Okay, well, certainly, right? There's there's an $18,000 variance or so there. When I really look at it, it's about 1500 bucks a month. I'm, I'm so entrenched in needing to win. I'm so bogged down with, man, I got, I got to win this battle that it, it caused me to focus on the wrong initiatives where I truly want to, I use software that's called ERI, the Economic Research Institute that pulls from ADP and Reynolds and Reynolds and, and allows you to type in a job description, an industry type, a geographical region, and it shows you what people are making with specific roles. So now mm -hmm. my hiring process, there's no guessing to it. I type it in, I see, okay, if you've got this much experience, this size company, this number of direct reports, your pay should be between, you know, this number and this number. And I'm searching for people that are on the high side that have the skill set that I can mentally recalibrate and say, okay, instead of 60,000, I want the guy that comes in that that's worth 75 to 77, because mm -hmm. that Delta, that difference, that extra 17 grand is the difference between having to coach somebody sometimes versus him or her coaching me. Like that talent needs to be better at their skills than I am at their skills, which as our company has grown, right? Doesn't take a whole lot. I'm not an HR professional, right? As, as we look at it, but it's even looking, what's the right job title? Is it HR generalist? Is it HR specialist? Is it director of human resources? It's to me, most of us haven't been trained on what are the right titles? How do I know what the right title is with the right job description and the right direct reports? So the, the whole hiring process is, is crazy because so many of us have, I, I was never classically trained on this, right? Again, engineering by field of study. There was no course that taught me how to maximize an org chart and figure out compensation plans. And like, it's, mm -hmm. you just kind of winging it, right? You just, oh, I'm going to try this right now. I heard this other guy say, this is the way to do it. And it's that acknowledgement that in different seasons, there, it might require you to recalibrate what you've been doing because you've got new in insight, right? I heard you say, you know, some masterminds you're a part of brilliant places to get information from as long as the people are much further down the road and have tried things more than you've tried. Anybody can have that one hit wonder that goes platinum, right? You get that new agency owner that comes in. I did a hundred million dollars this year. How long have you been in business for? One and a half years. Why well, honor the hundred million dollars? Like I want to celebrate that person. I can't really listen to them about operations or systems or processes because they haven't had to experience it yet. I'd rather learn from the guy that's been in business for seven, 10, 12 years. That's at 30 million because mm -hmm. he or she has messed some stuff up. He or she knows, okay, I tried this system and this system and this, and, and here's what I came out with. And so it's even being, being very conscientious of who we take that information from and which pieces do we listen to versus which pieces do we test? I, you know, like I was asking you that, that question from the perspective of really as a business owner, as a CEO, how 
uh, you see that to understand like uh, way of thinking for the really great CEO. And uh, one of the uh, different questions uh, about the leverage, like what's in your opinion, the leverage, how important it is for you uh, of, as a CEO, uh, for people like to leverage their finances, time, outcome, what's in really important points about that? And I really wondering to hear your opinion about it. I think I think leverage is is paramount as long as you understand the leverage and the leverage points. Right. We've spoken quite a bit about it through our conversation today is leveraging our time. But to start with, you know, I've got some friends that are early in their entrepreneurial journey, right? Their their businesses might be netting three or four hundred thousand dollars a year. And they're trying to leverage, they, they've got three VAs trying to help manage their email. They're, they're, they're trying to create too much leverage too quickly, where it's like, mm -hmm. whoa, whoa, hold on a second. It, like there's a time and a place and we have to figure out are you doing this because it's sexy right now or are you doing it because you heard it on gary v are you doing it because it matters or are you doing it because it's actually creating leverage where there's the appearance of leverage and there's the reality of leverage which are two different things to me especially as we look at time and so it goes back to the i'll call it those seasons that we're in in different businesses where in order to grow at some point we have to leverage our time which means we have to find great talent to support us or we have to create systems and processes right a good friend of mine someone i've spent time with someone that's that i, I would call a mentor is a, a gentleman named ari mazel ari professes to be the i'll say the most efficient and effective man in the world now i i don't doubt that he is right he's a one-man coaching consulting company he does i'll say three to ten million dollars a year i know it's a big range but that part doesn't matter but he runs his entire coaching protocol off of voxer he doesn't do live calls. He doesn't do one-to-one -one conversations. Everything is asynchronous. It's a really sizable investment, but over time he's documented the processes. So when I say, Hey, I'm, I'm really struggling with hiring great talent. He's like, okay, what do you mean by struggle? And it's all, it's all asynchronous. It's all back and forth whenever he gets around to it. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, the talent's not sticking. Okay. Well, here's my blog post. Here's a, a private um you know podcasts i recorded and here's the system i built it's a go smart read way those. go 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 read those and implement them have a great day and like <laughs> at some point we have to acknowledge right as coaches mentors consultants that we are answering the same question multiple different ways and so it's not about how much time i get to spend with a mentor it's about how much impact that mentor makes in my life and it's not this time for money equation it's an impact for money equation and so he's just the, the most efficient, uh, effective man, right? He's got a, a great blog that's free, a great podcast that's free. Really, really a big fan of Ari. But it comes down to, he's got an acronym that that is, is LEAD, right? You got to leverage the things you're brilliant at. You got to eliminate the stuff that's just white noise. You got to automate as much as you can through technology. Then you delegate everything else that's left. Like our job is to consistently every quarter kind of go through this process optimization and say, where am I spending my time? Judgment free. If I'm spending too much time on email or too much time on the phone or too much time on trainings or too much time traveling or too much time at the gym, let's look at those. Let's be honest with those. Where's my time going? And how can I create leverage points every quarter that's progressing me more towards that ideal life? And sometimes that is capital, right? Hey, I've made a bunch of money. It's sitting in the bank. There is no leverage on it. I got to do something with it. And sometimes it's Okay, the, the quarter was good, but I've got that system built. I feel really good about the leverage on my finances, but man, I'm at the gym two hours a day because I put on an extra 10 pounds as I was making all the money last quarter and I, that's not working either. And so it's, it's this, it goes back to that Kaizen methodology of process optimization. Leverage is never done. It's to me, it's, it's how often are you revisiting and being really honest with yourself of mm -hmm. and wh where could I get better at some leverage here? without judgment, without fear, right? There's all those negative emotions that especially as entrepreneurs, sometimes we get siloed in our, in our little boxes, right? We're in our office. There's not a lot of people around us. There's people are looking to us for answers, but we can't tell them I'm burnt out. I'm tired. I'm, I'm frustrated. I don't want to do this. I put on weight. I'm insecure. We don't want to tell them that the shame, the guilt, the sorrow, like those are things that we all feel. Those, those don't actually propel us forward though. So the, it's acknowledging, man, I feel that right now. What can I do to shift through that? And that, that to me is really where you really start to focus on that leverage. It's how to become the most efficient, effective you can in the gym. It's probably not by putting in more hours and it's probably not by starving ourselves, right? The leverage might be 
getting a blood panel done, figuring out the deficiencies in your hormones, optimizing your hormones, and spending an intense 37 minutes in the gym with exact focus where you're not messing around, having a conversation, mm -hmm. texting, listening to an audiobook. You're in there crushing it for 37 minutes and you only give yourself 37 minutes. And, and 37 is arbitrary, right? I don't have some magic 37 minute workout, mm -hmm. but it's, it's that sort of thing where when we force ourselves to experience leverage, we experience it. Nice, man. It's, it's an amazing answer. Super open. And uh, as well, I love how you were giving example about uh, the person who you consider as your mentor. Uh, what's his name again? Ari Mazel. A-R-I-M-E-I-Z-E-L. Awesome. Because like that's, uh, that's something which is, you know, the most expensive consulting. It's not like, let me show you how to do it. Not let me uh, go and do it with you. It's about, let me look how you implement it. So it means he just share with you a couple of things and will let you study it and he will see how you implement, uh, how you understand the subject and you implement it. So it's an awesome outcome. So it's really, uh, it was a super open question or answer. And uh, one of the last questions, which is I'm asking to everyone, <clears throat> it's quite short. And I just wondering your opinion about that. What's on your personal uh, experience it means for you. Uh, what would you choose? The journey or end result? Man, what a great question. That's all going to be perspective to me. If I'm earlier, I'm going to choose the end result. But as I have achieved different end results, I look back and I see the William, uh, br brilliance and the wisdom in the journey itself. But in the moment, I'm not wired to say like, man, I really like the 18 hour days, the sleepless nights, the endless travel. I mean, I enjoy it because I know it's part of the process. I just think it's a different seasons. I think there's different focal points where it might be a, a, a nonsensical answer, but it's both. It depends on which side of the mountain I'm looking from, right? If I'm, if I'm looking towards the top of the next hill, man, I just want to get to the top of the next hill. But as I'm almost at that peak and I look down, man, I've come a long way and learned a lot of lessons. And then I look towards the next hill. So it's both to me. It's it's absolutely both. Your answer one of the most unique so far in terms of like how you consider that. I mean, both it's kind of tricky way to answer, but the way how you explain it, that that's really deep because uh, that's true in terms of your experience. And still, I have uh, friends who are having high experience, unbelievable high revenue companies, but they choosing and the result because they are focused only on exit. I mean, just to ex expand as, as it needed, 60 mils, and after that, just make it the exit. But still, like, awesome answer. I really, Ryan, appreciate for being on the podcast. We are just running out of time. And uh, I'm more than sure that audience who are gonna be listening to, to us today, gonna be getting a lot of golden nuts because you made such a deep uh, explanations of some important processes when you are scaling your company and you need to understand the systems and what's really important for the company to be to be able to jump on the next level and do that on the most less painful way that's just my summary and uh, i do appreciate for all those insights i just highlighted for myself as well a couple of points for sure and uh, love all your answers thank you for your time and if you have anything to share with, with your audience with our audience maybe you would like to say where they can find it to you maybe they will decide to go on coaching with you how what's the way how they can uh, get in touch with you yeah, so really been an honor and privilege to spare, share time and space with you. Love your answers and thoughtfulness and love your questions. The places to find me are ryanidell.com. That's R-Y-A-N-N-I-D-D-E-L.com. Oddly enough, at this moment, I don't have a course or a training, right? If you want to sign up for my newsletter, I share what I'm up to. I share what I'm doing. There's not a promotional aspect to it. Or, or the social handles, right? Every social handle is Ryan Nidell, where again, I believe at some point in our journey, it becomes our responsibility to, to share very openly what we've been up to, what's working, what's not working, and, and help other people achieve, you know, the next, the next rung of the ladder that they're reaching for. So would be honored if you follow along, would be honored. Feel free to send me a direct message. I, I manage all my own social. So if you're stuck somewhere and I might have an answer, I'd be happy to share it with you. 
Amazing. Uh, definitely, we're going to be sharing under our podcast all the details so the guys can find it to you uh, the best possible way. And again, appreciate for your time. Uh, looking forward for the future podcast because I believe there is a lot of things which you can share with the audience in the future, especially according to the feedback of the guys. We will see what we can cover else. Thanks, man, for your experience and for sharing that with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you.